I want to thank a few folks who helped uh, make this day happen. Um, our Dean Nora Chapman and Associate Dean Sergio Laporta. I want to thank um, our new Provost Saul Jimenez Sandoval, who is here with us today, um, and who, when he was Dean, actually hired me, so thank you, and hired us. <laughs> all of us hired half the crew today. Um, so thank you so much, Saul. Um, we're so, I think all of us are so excited to have um, your leadership and to know that you're a reader and writer of poetry as well. A provost who writes poetry. Yes, round of applause for Saul. Thank you so much for your support and for being here. Um, thank you to the folks at the Fresno County Public Library, um, Mary Johnson, who was instrumental in helping us set up um, this space, and Laura Fleek as well. Um, Poets and Writers is one of our sponsors, so shout out to them. Thank you to Dr. Lisa Westens, who I believe is also here today, our chair, hello, of the English departments. And our wonderful staff, New Her and Liz Bolaños for helping out today, as well as Lisa Galvez and Jefferson Beavers, who are always behind the scenes, like making every making all the magic happen. So we thank you. And also big thanks to my um, colleagues as well in the MFA program. Um, this is always a very special annual reading. It's the first time, it's the one time during the year we all kind of come together as faculty and get to just hear each other, and hear each other's words and hear each other's art. So very special day. Um, a couple of announcements about events coming up. Um, we have our MFA student showcase thesis readings coming up this uh, November and December. So our graduating students this year are going to be reading and presenting their work. These are all, these are just incredibly um, special and moving and powerful readings always. So um, please join us on November 22nd and December 6th for those. Those will be back on campus, yeah. Um, and then uh, my colleague Vanita Professor Vanita Blackburn is um, the organizer of something called the Live Right Workshop, and it's this amazing program for writers of color that she started in Arizona, and it's um, also got roots now here in the Valley, so there'll be a poetry writing workshop um, to launch that series on Saturday, uh, December 14th, and that will actually be um, taught by yours truly, so um, please come out for that, the Live Right Writing Workshop. All of these um, events are on our websites, on the English program website. Um, you can also follow us on all the social media, so social media channels, um, the creative writing media channels as well. Um, and then lastly, just a quick plug. Um, for those of you who are interested in supporting um, everything we do here at the College of Arts and Humanities, the creative writing program, the students, there's something called Day of Giving coming up that maybe some of you already know about. Um, as the faculty member on the development committee, I'm sort of the faculty ambassador for that. Um, so that's happening Thursday, November 7th, and that's a day when anyone in the community can contribute um, and just to, to help support programs like this, to help support our student scholarships, to help support um, our events. So November 7th, mark your calendars. Um, I believe that's, yeah, I think we got them. Um, I believe that's it for announcements and, and thanks. Um, we'll sort of go uh, by alphabetical last name for the eight of us reading today and um, we'll just briefly introduce each other as we go. Um, and to close, we will, of course, invite you to hang out for some snacks. We'll have a reception and some drinks and to sign books and buy books by faculty as well. So with that, we have our first reader, um, my colleague, Vanita Blackburn. coordinating all of this. You did a great job and now it's a, a lot of plugging for all of our <laughs> events. So thank you for doing that. And I brought my collection up here for inspiration more than anything, but I'm going to read some new works. So I'm inspired by Bren as well because she's reading all new things these days. So I'm going to go ahead and leap into the future. So, and the story that I'm reading is actually um, uh, based on some of the characters that exist in this collection. So it's not totally outside of the box. And um, what do you need to know about it? So it's a sort of a, um, a, a horror story, kind of a scary story, but it's scary in the way that works for me. Like I grew up on you know, watching horror movies when I was six years old with my mom, because she was into that. So there wasn't, you know, so the, I'm not really afraid of you know, monsters or, or people or like you know, vampires, 
I just, even today, on Sunday morning, I'll just curl up and watch a, you know, a horror movie, and it just feels like, you know, like comfort. So, um, <laughs> but, but there are things that, that, that really will scare me. So I'm, I'm afraid of, you know, like disease, you know, things that we don't see coming. Uh, bacteria, marriage, all that stuff. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna read this one. And I'm still trying to figure out how to read it. It's brand new. So I have uh, two characters talking in certain places. And one of them, and when one speaks, I'll go like this. When the other speaks, I'll go like this because they don't have tags like normal people. So I'm breaking all the rules. So, and when you become a teacher to my students that came, you can do this. But for your for early days, put your tags. All right, Ambien and brown liquor. Me and T went to the Denny's across from the hospital at three in the morning the night Mama tried to kill herself. T ordered a BLT sandwich on sourdough with fries. I got the pancake breakfast with eggs sunny side up, hash browns and bacon. The waitress was good, never asked us how we were doing, just punctuated all of her sentences with sweetie. What can I get you, sweetie? Anything to drink, sweetie? Coming right up, sweetie. Why didn't you get the chocolate ones like always, T asked. I'm trying out the blueberry. She sat back in the booth like it was really something to think about. The blueberry pancakes versus the chocolate pancakes with the whipped cream smiley face. Certainly this was not a time for smiles in our food and she understood that after I did. Maybe figuring out that late was the problem. We should have been covered in blood. We hadn't been taught the proper signs of death, how it doesn't lurk in dark robes or burst from a warrior's chest in battle or appear as a slow motion spray of brain matter and other vital organs scattered in the wind like dark dandelion fluff. That would have made more sense than looking the way we always look, except in the face. T looked old as shit. Maybe we both did. Girls our age usually showed up at diners in the middle of the night coming down off pills and wine coolers after being molested for hours on a dance floor. You look like Auntie Tammy, I told her. Fuck you, she said. <laughs> it was dark outside and quiet with a thin fog that made the street lights fuzzy and jittery. Only two other groups were in the entire restaurant that was large enough to hold 50 or 100, I don't know. A few tables away, from a, away a family waited, two women, a youngish man, and a girl with a pink balloon tied to her wrist, asleep in a woman's lap. The balloon hovered above them all, singular and swaying in the air conditioning. On the other aisle was a couple, two older men, sad like us, but a different way. They ate soup and ice water with lemon. All of them should have been covered in blood dried and full of tissue and matted hair. It should be fresh too, running in places from wounds always recently torn open and from the dead that drove onto them. The droopy men and the heavy women and the little girl with her shoe about to fall off her foot as she drooled on the woman's lap, all of them should have been covered in blood. Then the waitress came over and brought our coffee. She too awash in death, smiling behind the steam from mugs. Here you go, sweeties. I imagine the coagulated masses of torn flesh drop into the cups from her chin like red pubes of sugar. Thank you, Lisa. I remember going to the emergency room as a kid when an ant crawled into my ear and wouldn't come out. Mama held my head under the faucet while I cried, but nothing, nothing washed it out. It's in there, I yelled over and over, hearing it bang and buzz around inside me like a mad tiny chef cooking stir fry. T looked up at me, then out to the street. She held her coffee like a woman that had lived a lifetime and earned every sip. In the zombie apocalypse, would you kill me if I got bit? T sweetened her coffee, tasted it, then sweetened it some more. Or what? Or just let me turn. Would you try to eat me? Of course. <laughs> I took a bite of bacon and slit the eggs with my fork so the yolk ran into the hash browns. T leaned forward with her elbows on the table and looked out into the dark, empty streets. No cars passed, no people passed. There was nothing out there. How would you want me to kill you then? I don't care if it hurts some. Really? Yeah, that's fine. I try not to make it hurt though. So you would kill me. <laughs> I dropped my fork. She squirted ketchup on her fries and began to eat. Is that a problem? You seem, you seem like you want it. A lot of times you deserve it. I would just have to remember how annoying you are and then just boom. Mm -hmm. We had very little practice with death before that year and the bitch just began outforming, outforming itself all around us. First, no one was dead, then everyone seemed to be gone or leaving. Life felt like the mystery. All of the people around us acted as if they were alive when really they were closer to the end than they liked to think. 
None of the dead and dying we knew looked like they were supposed to. So you shoot me, your favorite sister, my only sister, and maybe. Do we get guns in this movie? It's not a movie. I just want to know what to expect. Would you kill me then? No. What? You just let me run around all gross and eat people? Yes. That's crazy. She sipped her super sweet coffee and seemed to begin aging backwards a little. I was glad for that. I saw T more in that moment. Maybe I would kill her in the zombie apocalypse if she looked more like T. Pretty, her dark eyes cutting deep into whatever she stared at. Maybe I would just let her die like that, with that face. Right now, you have to promise to shoot me in the fucking face if I get bit by a fucking zombie. I do not want to live forever as a chest rotting, bones out, jaw swinging corpse. I laughed at her imitating a zombie jaw. Do that again. <laughs> she did. I laughed harder. The men with the suit got up to pay their bill. The little girl was awake and sipping orange juice from a child's cup. Look, she said, promise, I would kill you, then kill myself, so we wouldn't have to deal with any of it. But what if there's a cure? You just popped us both, and the next day they announced free cures for everybody recently infected, and we're all dead and shit. <laughs> she smiled. Well, that would be a problem. Yes, a problem. But we're dead, so it wouldn't matter. Dead people don't have problems. She reached over with her fork and took a piece of pancake. These aren't as good as the chocolate ones. You just wanted me to get those so you could have some. She ate another piece, then another, and quit trying to enjoy her terrible coffee. T liked to eat her sugar rather than drink it. We waited in the car until the sun came up before going back into the hospital. The most frightening things that eat up our lives can't be seen. Simple bacteria, free radicals, cholesterol, time, protein deficiencies, cortisol, vanity, ambition, carcinogens, love, and all the erratic chemicals of grief and abandonment. T found Mama on the sofa after coming home late. I'd been asleep for a while when I heard T screaming and screaming as if there had been a massacre, blood everywhere and nowhere. Our mother rested the whole day after having a tube inserted into her stomach to siphon the contents. Because she arrived unconscious, they gave her a tracheal intubation to make sure she didn't inhale the poisons during extraction. When I had the ant removed, the doctor smiled in my face and asked if I wanted to keep it. I thought they might bottle up the juices from Mama's belly and ask if we wanted to take them home, but that didn't happen. We left with no proof at all. Okay, that's it for my, my story. guys for being my test subjects. It is really new, so thank you. And next up is the amazing other half of the fiction department, <laughs> Joe Casera. Yeah, how's this? Can you hear me? Thanks for coming out today. I will also read new work. First time that I've read new work in a, like a year, I think. Um, so the title of the story is called An Arrangement. I'm just going to read from the beginning of it. Um, I guess that's all I'll say about it. You know that it is a truth rarely universally acknowledged that the straights, once they've coupled, are very dramatic about their breakups. <laughs> Take, for example, your friend Linda. Blonde, Botox, absolute darling, who despite living in Irvine, still has a rich inner life. When she found out that her husband was fucking their neighbor, who was also a friend, who every summer Friday had sat by Linda's side at her pool in her backyard, well, she marched right up to that backstabbing floozy's door, her husband's dirty laundry in hand, threw it on the floor and said, why don't you do his fucking laundry, bitch? <laughs> or when your aunt and uncle finally decided to, tie, to cut the knot, they didn't know that it would take seven full years of fucking each other and attorney fees. In year two and a half, something snapped inside him. He broke into her house, shut off the hot lamp, keeping the two iguanas alive, then smoked a cigarette and left, left it in the ashtray like a giant middle finger for her to discover. And the poor iguanas, Bob and Marley, may they rest in peace. You never imagine that it will happen to you. Your partner of six years, Victor, is a level-headed infectious disease researcher. He's working on the newest iteration of PrEP, a shot people can have administered at a clinic every two months. You love how smart he is and how he has used his intelligence for the betterment of mankind. You, on the other hand, are an artist of moderate success. You sometimes feel guilty about this and wonder what role oil paintings play in society, especially when the world feels like it's calling out like a dumpster fire. 
still, you paint. You say to yourself, at least I'm not Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> there is the day you catch Victor looking at an unfinished canvas in your studio, an oil portrait of a Pomeranian named Biscuit, whose dog parents in Palo Alto have commissioned you to complete for $3,000 plus materials. The money is nothing to balk at, but you joke that the task is so absurd it might turn you into a Marxist. <laughs> when you walk in, Victor looks at you and says, this is exquisite, and he kisses you with such passion that you feel lucky. And you should feel lucky, because the two of you have an Instagrammable life. A small modern apartment in the Bay that gets amazing natural light, the occasional vacation, a solid credit score, healthy bodies that say gym membership. You are both in your early 30s and in love. You dream of the day he will present you with a ring and you can craft your registry at Bloomingdale's. All the flatware and vases and frames you will ask people to shower you with. Neither of you has student loans and you make sure to never bring this up at dinner parties. But now, in a blinding turn of events, it does happen to you. The scene, your apartment, at the dining room table, where you prepare chicken breasts with an umami marinade and green beans with thinly sliced almonds while listening to Rachel Maddow in the background like the good, well-informed gay that you are. <laughs> you know that Victor always enjoys this meal, and when he walks into the apartment, he looks like he's been through it. When you sit down for dinner, he says that he needs to talk to you about something. You feel your stomach churn. He says that he's sorry. He doesn't look at you when he talks, instead focusing on the tines of his fork, slowly toying with a single green bean. You tell him to just say it already. I slept with Marcos, he says, from the gym. Marcos is the 19-year-old Brazilian guy who scans member passes at the welcome desk. Marcos is beautiful, and this is even more upsetting and enraging to you. You pour more wine in the glass and drink it all. Say something, he says. What do you want me to say? Anything but silence, please. You think of the scene in The Sopranos where Edie Falco throws a motherfucking yadro at the wall. Each shard probably worth $1,000. What did she even say to Tony? You don't remember. What you do remember, however, is that after the throw, her French manicure was unscathed. And that, you think, is catharsis. You stab three green beans and bring them to your mouth. They are full of flavor from the red vinegar, but your mouth no longer wants flavor. Tell me about Marcos, you say. Was he a good fuck? Did he make you feel good? Your words are dry and sharp, and Victor starts to cry. You think that his tears are wildly unfair. You are the one who wants to cry, full on like Sally Field in Steel Magnolias, or Shirley MacLaine in terms of endearment. You want to say, I'm the one that loves you, but you bang some fuckboy from the gym, 19, practically a child. But you don't. Instead, you think of the time he told you that you only understand emotion through the lens of popular culture. A cold thing to say, brutal, in a way. Perhaps only tangentially related to the truth, but you hadn't pushed the point. These were the icons that had struck a chord with you when you were a child in Georgia. The Judys, Liza's, Barbara's, Celine's. Even nowadays, Beyonce's sister had to kick a man with a stiletto heel in an elevator just to make a point. What was that pain to them, those stars who could still stand before their crowds, at least claiming resilience? Now, you practice the cold veneer of rage. Tell me, you say again. I want to know every last detail. He tells you everything, and when you're done with dinner, you go to the kitchen sink and vomit. He comes up behind you and places his hand on your shoulder. There's no dirty laundry to throw, no iguanas to freeze, no expensive sculptures to break into shards. He hands you a glass of cold water. The two cubes float to the top. What can I do, he says, to make this better? I want you to take me to Palm Springs this weekend, you say, and then I want you to shut the fuck up. He does not, however, shut the fuck up. Instead, you talk about the state of things. You sit beside him and he is beside himself with crying. He tells you he wants to open up the relationship and you agree because you are afraid that saying no will mean losing him. He uses the word arrangement and you have heard this word before. Jordan and Kyle have an arrangement. So do Miguel and Julian, Sammy and Deshaun, Joseph and Andreu, the Jasons. It seems like the way of things for gay men of a certain age. That night, you take a Vicodin and listen to an ASMR video of someone painting a wall. Just the sound of the roller squishing the paint, the bristles going up and down, back and forth. The man's voice says, 
Now I'm painting the wall. And then there's another layer for you. Once you drift, you dream of walls, off-white, canary yellow, the most magnificent royal purples. You sit in this marvelous reupholstered antique chair, arms and legs in Boston gold with red velvet cushions. In that chair alone, you watch the layers of paint dry until you wake up in an empty bed. Victor has already left for work. On the kitchen counter, a cup of espresso is proof that he was even there. The next morning, you call your friend Julian. You tell him everything and that you're feeling a certain kind of way. Oh, honey, Julian says. Just because Victor's dick is in a wandering kind of mood doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Julian is so rational. He works in HR for a tech company in the Embarcadero. He tells you that this is not uncommon. You'll get through it, and who knows, maybe you'll meet someone hot at a gallery. And when you do, he says, you better call me and tell me all the details. You laugh and say that you agree, but right now, more than anything, it's the shock of the scenario that has gotten to you. I hear what you're saying, Julian says, and I understand, everything will be all right. I guess my only other option, you say, is to pull a Lorena Bobbitt, chop off his dick and leave it on the side of some freeway. <laughs> Julian gasps deliciously and says, Queen, don't make me laugh at work. I would never. It wouldn't be wise, Julian says. Who knows the unintended consequences? You know they sewed it back on and he wound up becoming a porn star? A porn star? Well, maybe star isn't the right word, but he did porn. That is grotesque. I know, Julian says, and it's not like he was monster hung or anything. I guess people were just curious. Julian, I will never be able to get that image out of my mind. You're welcome, dear. And then they go to Palm Springs and chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Church, nonfiction faculty member and editor of the Normal School and MFA coordinator. Thanks, Joe. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, continuing the trend, uh, I'm going to read from some new work. Uh, I've reached the point in my life where even my anxiety dreams are boring. Um, <laughs> well, I have like anxiety dreams about leaking faucets. Uh, it's kind of depressing. Um, but I've been writing and thinking about. Um, well, I'll just read. Um, I've been thinking of pools, swimming pools, the private, personal, and public kind, kidney, circular, and classic rectangular shaped, shallow ends and deep ends and their blue facsimiles of sky, captured and contained in a backyard. Our pool dog legs to the right where the plastered steps crumble from past neglect. And I've been thinking of decay and about the discomforting privilege that comes with owning such an oasis. Recent scientific studies and even a 2014 book have touted the psychological benefits of living or even just spending time near blue space. Basically, any body of water, no matter how manufactured or controlled it might seem. I think we all know the calming effects of ocean waves, a babbling brook or a bubbling backyard fountain, the kinds of water sounds you can find on relaxation apps or on a CD in a new age crystal shop. But these recent studies show that even those silent, stagnant, or chemically treated bodies of water, like a lake or a swimming pool, or maybe even a Fresno canal, can make you ha a happier and healthier person. For the first time in my life, after living for over a decade in California, the birthplace of the private swimming pool, I'm finally, irrevocably, a pool owner. But I'm not sure if this makes me happier or healthier. Plenty of people, including our parents and our real estate agent, told us we'd regret the decision. Regret is a big word a heavy psychological burden. Regret isn't healthy or happy. They said a swimming pool is a lot of work, time consuming, always dirty. You have to clean it and care for it constantly, like a baby. They didn't say that part about the baby. <laughs> they also didn't say owning a swimming pool will make you question your existence. Thousands of years ago, the San Joaquin Valley was the bottom of a great inland sea stretching from the delta in the north all the way to the grapevine in the south, 
Some scientists believe a massive earthquake cracked the bowl and drained the sea into the Pacific Ocean. When I fly over the city of Fresno descending again into the valley from some distant land, I love to scan the sea bottom landscape of fields furrowed with vines and fruit trees and almonds and cotton. I'm always looking for places I recognize from above, looking for windows to the past. Swimming pools appear, soft shapes set against angular roof lines juxtaposed with rectangles, and I notice how the lines make crosses, cutting against the blue pool bodies, like crucifixes above a bat baptismal fountain. And I can imagine as I descend that these pools are actual portals to the sea or some ancient underwater world. It doesn't take much to see myself leaping from the fuselage, arms extended, flying and diving, aiming for their blue promise of safe landing. Once, while flying over a glacier in Denali, on Denali in Alaska in a tiny airplane, our pilot, aptly named Bronco, pointed out what he called blue holes in the vast expanse of white ice. Technically known as Moulin, they form per bright blue perfect circles that look from above like backyard swimming pools. But Bronco told me these pools were hundreds, sometimes thousands of feet deep, sometimes stretching all the way to the base of the glacier. These were no kiddie pools. These were all deep end. Melt water from the glacier's surface pours into these holes, and some scientists believe that the water then helps lubricate the glacier's slow carving descent down a mountain, the kind of journey of ice that leaves a valley in its wake. We bought our house in October, just before the rain. So I waited through the winter months of the inevitable and for the inevitable and excruciating heat of Fresno to make swimming both tolerable and necessary. I waited and I watched and I spent an inordinate amount of time fussing with the new suction powered robotic pool sweep we enlisted to help with daily maintenance. His brand name is Creepy Crawley. Both words spelled with a K. And he's a replacement sucker. But I feel like we're getting to know each other now so I can use his nickname, KK. We're understanding how each of us works, KK and me, learning to appreciate the dynamics of our relationship. The other pool vacuum, Barracuda, had grown old and struggled to keep up with our demands. I think he, like me, most days was kind of ready to retire. KK, however, is young and full of energy and he inspires me. He's blue and he looks like the mutant offspring of a vacuum cleaner and a floor buffer with a rubber skirt that lies flat on the pool bottom. He doesn't whistle while he works, but he makes a kind of sputtering, clicking sound as he cruises around in patterns that I don't entirely understand. He's perpetually driven, it seems, by a logic of weights and floats and water pressure that mostly befuddles me. And he's male because he's a bottom feeder, or, be or because he's not a boat. As simple as KK may seem, it was often me standing at the fence beer in hand, wearing slippers and basketball shorts, cheering silently as he did his job. Good boy, I'd say to myself as I watched him moving rhythm rhythmically around the pool, shuddering across the plastered bottom in his inevitable orbits. Sometimes I think about how I was responsible for KK. Sometimes I think about all the times I had to rescue him. He'd get stuck in a corner and couldn't move, and if I didn't intervene, he'd just sit there sputtering sadly anxiously like a coyote chewing off his leg to get out of a trap. He could be so needy, so childlike, and that bothered me at first. I didn't need him to need me. But I think we're in a better place now. Even if one day this summer, I left him out in the sun and he started to dry out. His hose got a little kinked and his orbits now are more herky-jerky, a little twisted at times. This bothers me too because I don't want to admit that at least some of KK's failings are my fault. I should have been a better caregiver. I shouldn't have left him out that day. He doesn't like the sun. It saddens him, which saddens me. It was all so dumb, so preventable. All I had to do was kick him back in the pool where he belongs. But I forgot my job, forgot his body. And now poor KK just looks kind of funny, puttering around the pool with his wonky hose. His enviable orbits turned into something more like a drunken ramble, more like how I'd move around a pool. 
Okay, I'll admit it. Some days as I gazed at KK doing his thing, I didn't know if I was the coyote chewing or if I was KK freely moving, moving around these unpredictable orbits of life, sucking up the muck from the pool bottom, trying desperately to climb the walls of my reality, knowing I couldn't survive without the watery world in which I've always lived, knowing I'll be gasping and sucking for air on the outside, away from water. Yes, this is hyperbole. Yes, this is ridiculous, but so is owning a fucking swimming pool. <laughs> Pleasure. If you've been to these readings before, you'll know that this is often the point when I screw this up and I go sit down and forget to introduce Connie. Um, and so I'm going to make amends this time. Um, and just spare with, bear with me. Sorry. <laughs> bear with me a little bit. Um, so Connie officially retired a few years ago. Um, this is her last semester with us, which I'm trying not to think about. Um, but a few years ago, they had a retirement party, and I was asked to give a toast. And so I asked some of my students and uh, some former students to send me some thoughts uh, about Connie. And, and the prompt I gave them was, uh, Connie is like. And so I'm just going to read a few of these. Um, Connie is like leaves of grass. <laughs> the grandma of literature. One of the most chill people I ever met. A pioneer. The voice of comfort and reassurance, the hug that tells you that you belong and the nudge you need to take your writing where it needs to go. Like that oracle elf from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and a beautiful human being. Intimidating in the way that women I admire are always intimidating, confidence, grace, and wit. What a badass. The cool chick in the bar bathroom who gives you good advice and a free cigarette. <laughs> A hardworking and kind-hearted badass. Like Yoda, Martha, Martha Stewart, and Wonder Woman all wrapped into one. The greatest host who ever held a workshop. Trying to fill in a blank to describe Connie is like trying to cram the sky into a vase. In the end, whatever you come up with won't be enough to contain it. And ultimately, this is true. No words can quite reach the depths or totally capture what Connie has meant to the MFA program, our students, and to her colleagues. To me and many others, Connie has been a mentor, a friend, and an inspiration. She is a calming presence and grace that doesn't come from cotillion training, but instead from a lifetime of hard work and deep wells of wisdom, patience, and kindness. But don't let the hippie look fool you. Connie is also one of the most skillful administrators I've ever been around, like Machiavelli and the Buddha had a baby. <laughs> and I know we're going to miss her presence more than I can adequately express here today or any day, frankly. But on behalf of all of us, Connie, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you've done for our students, our program, this department, and the university. You're my hero. I look like a hippie. <laughs> oh my god. Thank you, Steve. I do like that I was a badass twice. <laughs> oh yeah. So I was gonna bring you down, but now I don't know if I can. Um so I'm gonna read um two poems, an old one and a new one. And uh, the first one that I'm gonna read is called Testimony. I've been working on a project lately uh, that's sort of about women and religion and power, uh, and in a way going back to the central ideas in this old poem. So I thought I'd read it today. I don't think I read it for a long time. There are two events that show up in the poem. One is, uh, um, not from my own poem. So when, is, when I was a kid, there was a neighbor in uh, our neighborhood that uh, he actually uh, murdered his own child. And so that's mentioned in the poem. 
And then when I was an adult in the 1970s in Salt Lake City, uh, there was a woman who had five children. She uh, marched them up to a, um, the top floor of one of the fancy hotels in downtown Salt Lake City and proceeded to, for what she believed were religious reasons, to throw them, push them, urge them to jump out the window, and then she followed them. Um, so that's also in the poem. The poem is in three parts. It's called Testimony. One. On the way to church, we'd pass the place the neighbor boy's body had been found a few days after his father beat in his brown-haired head with a quart-sized root beer bottle. The first day, we made ourselves go straight to the spot, some broken glass, a bare space in the field. The dirt turned a little, as if someone had thought of a garden and given it up. Nothing else. After that, we began to swerve, making a new path through the thick summer weeds. Inside scrubbed church walls, the world looked different. Soft-edged women sat, fanning themselves slowly with pastel cardboard fans, moving only their slender wrists, staring out into the blue air. Babies slept easily in their laps, safe, believing in good mothers who would catch them if they rolled and hold them if they cried. One by one, people stood, moved to testify to their faith in a merciful Jesus. Turning faces toward the smooth, white ceiling, they'd give thanks and plead for their lives. Two. At 17, I'd already learned what a man could do to me if he chose to. Each new time he climbed on top of me, I was trusting him with my life. He'd hold my wrist between his thumb and finger, saying I could, snap your, I could snap this in a second, or your arm, or your neck. And I knew the rancid taste of gratitude when he let me live. That may be why on a hot August morning, when I first saw my own baby, I was overcome by the uneasy revelation that giving birth is not giving life. Birth had been mostly out of my control. But those tiny wrists, her fingers, her delicate wobbly head told me clearly that she was at my mercy. I'd have to decide again every day to let her live. Three, when the woman on the 15th floor began throwing her children out the window one by one, the citizens of Salt Lake City were powerless to stop her. We ran back and forth in the streets below begging her to have mercy on her children. We would have given her anything, money, our houses and cars, even love to save one of those falling bodies. And we would have fallen happily to our own knees in the ripe gratitude of an errant child whose punishment on a whim had been rescinded. But mercy, after all, is just another word for power. And on that clean city sidewalk, as we covered up what was left, we began to understand our position. She was, closer, she was closer to her ancient God than any of us could imagine, and she had accepted the terrible responsibility that comes with being above other people. Okay, so uh, this next one is new, and um, I've worked with wonderful students here um, for all my years at Fresno State, many wonderful students. And one of those uh, had almost completed work on her MFA degree. Her name was Mia Barraza Martinez when she was killed in a car accident three years ago. This was a huge loss for me personally and for our entire community. I've been trying, mostly failing, for the, for the last three years to, to write about this. Um, and this poem is what I've come up with so far. Um, it's called, But There Was Rain, and it has a little epigraph uh, from one of Mia's amazing poems. But There Was Rain. And crickets and frogs take up the song, sing like breathing. Mia Barraza Martinez. 
While I drive to the market in Fresno, you're heading north on the 99. While I turn left into a dark, puddle-splashed parking lot, while I, slip, while I slog through murky water, jacket pulled awkwardly over my head, while I pick out plum tomatoes, yellow and red peppers, finger-sized zucchinis, and a fragrant handful of basil, while I search for fresh pasta and a crusty loaf of bread, while I pay and pack it all soft, safely into my cloth bag, wade back across the flooded asphalt, while I make my way home, windshield wipers carving out their half moons of clarity, while I open a bottle of wine, while I pour two glasses, toast to the welcome and necessary rain, chat easily with a friend as we salt and stir boiling water, chop and toss a simple meal together in my oblivious kitchen. Maybe right then you are singing. Most likely you are singing loudly, above the radio, above the hoarse whistling of the wind, above the wheel you hold steady. And maybe you open and maybe you open a window. And maybe you open a window to feel the electric fingers of the rain, and maybe you stretch your left arm out to catch the tingle of the world's wet breath on your skin. I imagine you watching the tall trees ripple and sway in the wind, loving the way they dance along the dark edges of the highway, and loving the ruffled oleanders heaving and cresting their way up the median and the stunning psychedelic color bursts as your headlights confront the wet air. While you are driving and singing and happy like that, your car skids. Tires lose their grip for a split second on a slick patch of asphalt, hurling the car up an embankment where it flips and lurches back into traffic. And you become the wind and the rain, and we are left in this storm's arbitrary wake with the almost unbearable weight of snapped tree limbs and scrubbed clean pavement and the clear, relentless air of morning and your bold, unstoppable song. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the next reader will be, uh, after all these years, he's still my favorite colleague, John Hales. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'll reading, I'm reading something, uh, it's, it's new, but it's, uh, it's work that I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to figure out a, an essay I started a couple of years ago that's turned into kind of a, an obsession and a labor of love, and I know that doesn't really translate into good writing, necessarily. But I'm just going to read some, uh, from a few sections from that. Um, it's, uh, it started as a response to a statement by Sam Zyke, who was a survivor of the shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School, where he said, I don't understand why I can still go into a store and buy a weapon of war, an AR. The essay includes my own experience growing up in the 1950s and 60s among hunters in Utah, a time and place when we seemed to observe a strict boundary enforced in practice, if not in words, between the weapons that our fathers and grandfathers had used in their wars World Wars I and II in Korea, and the rifles we had to deal with. The current popularity of the AR-15, the near identical twin of the military M16 and M4, and its strained and awkward use as a hunting rifle, tell us that something profound has changed in American attitudes concerning the relationship between war and peace. And I'll begin with two epigraphs, which is pretty fancy for like an eight minute reading, but. The first is from the Bible, Isaiah chapter two. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the second is, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. <laughs> of course, that is Beto O'Rourke. I'm speaking uh, after 22 people have been killed in his hometown, El Paso. Okay, the first section. Um, writing this essay has required my revisiting 1960s era editions of the Shooter's Bible, the in-stick annual compendiums that listed and described every firearm currently on the market, 
the pages in which I, as a teenager, sought information and inspiration concerning ways I might increase my personal arsenal. I read these annuals with the same hope and faith I'd only a few Christmas seasons earlier read the Sears and Roebuck catalog. The 1967 Tudor's Bible lists hundreds of bolt or lever action large game hunting rifles, but I found only six occupying the category of auto loaders, one of which was Colt's AR-15 Sporter semi-automatic rifle. And although its form is instantly recognizable today as America's favorite rifle, it looks like nothing else in the catalog, displaying an aptitude for neither hunting and target shooting nor any other recognizably sporting function. This, relatively, this relative anonymity was borne out by slow sales figures and by the judgment of gun magazines, with one writer dismissing in 1980 the AR-15 as, quote, just another copy of military-type rifles that should be classed as junk guns. I left guns and shooters' Bibles behind me as I developed less murderous interest. So when I began paying attention to all, of, all the numbers, and the emergence of the AR-15 as the weapon of choice for mass shooters, I found myself unable to apply what I thought I'd learned about the difference between military spec weaponry and those guns and rifles designed for purely sporting purposes, hunting in particular. Although the AR-15 is pretty easy to modify, gun magazine writers have compared its ease of disassembly modification to Legos and Mr. Potato Head, and one Iraq War veteran has even called the AR-15 a Barbie doll for men. Mm -hmm. I'm slowly learning that many enthusiasts don't really want to modify their AR-15s to more hunting-specific configurations, preferring not only to purchase and employ a weapon that's virtually identical to its Vietnam and Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and as of today, Syrian oil fields counterpart, but to accessorize it so as to appear more military, more standard army issue. In my first deer hunt in 1967, I endured a lot of grief from my companions for hunting deer with a weapon of war, a World War I era infield I found in my grandpa's basement. AR-15 hunters, on the other hand, if we're to trust the, the photographs in gun magazines, enter the woods with a rifle that looks and feels ready for combat, the weapon that demands to be carried the same way troops in Afghanistan carry theirs, slung on slings across their chests, hand on the pistol grip, index finger held straight alongside the trigger guard, holding their assault rifles at the ready for mule deer, or one can't help imagine insurgents. As every discussion of the AR must inevitably do, the first chapter of the gun owner's latest scriptural commentary, The Shooter's Bible Guide to the AR-15, brings us back to the AR-15's first incarnation as the military M16, along with the M16's current iteration, the M4. The relevant verses read, uh, I'm quoting, with what is now a generation of American soldiers recently cycled out of Iraq and Afghanistan, and is comfortable on the end of a tactical rifle, if not more so than many traditional sporting arms, it should be no surprise that the popularity of ARs has migrated into hunting camps and lodges around the country. It has been a natural progression throughout American history that what, use, what is used and proven in war nearly always makes its way into the fields and forests back home. This assertion that a weapon, quote, used and proven in war nearly always makes its way back home simply isn't true, or it's true only in the broadest and least relevant sense. My own awkwardly outlier teenage experience hunting with an unmodified weapon of war and the research I've done since then tell me that the relationship between a particular war standard infantry weapon and the rifle that hunters take into the fields and forests in the decades following that war is at best murky and indirect, more reactive than sequential, a progression that is anything but natural. And this is, important understand, this is important understanding the way the civilian popularity of the AR-15 is something new and deeply troubling in our country's history. Throughout the late 19th and most of the 20th century, the influence of wartime weaponry on civilian sporting rifles was either subtle or contrary. Recruits' experience with Springfields and infields in World War I led to the increased popularity of the bolt action over the widely accepted lever of pump action. But the weapons of World War I sold as surplus were subject to substantial and usually loving modification. The term of art here is borderization before hunters took them to the field. By the way, this will all be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> okay. 
Civilian resistance to military weaponry for hunting purposes became even more dramatic following World War II. The M1 Garand, the semi-automatic rifle that American infantrymen carried by the millions into World War I or World War II battlefields and a few years later into Korea, was like its Springfield antecedent, perfectly suited for sporterization. Nevertheless, when these soldiers boarded troop ships and headed to the comforts of home and post-war amnesia, they returned to their determinedly civilian bolt-action Winchesters and Remingtons, the civilian rifles they'd hunted with in the decades before the war. Even though the M1 was widely and inexpensively available as war surplus, no one hunted with an M1. And our parents passed on this tradition, which was less swords into plowshares than leave the goddamn swords on the battlefields where they belong. They passed this on to us, their baby boomer offspring, who hunted deer with decidedly civilian rifles. The solid, slow, but dependable and accurate 30 caliber rifles brought new, excuse me, bought new from factories in Massachusetts and Ohio or beaten unconditionally into sporterized pruning hooks. I've noticed that most gun journalists today discussing the AR-15 beyond its acronym studiously avoid using the term assault rifle, routinely preferring instead the term tactical rifle, which has its own set of problems. Some years ago, the gun industry's National Shooting Sports Foundation circulated a memo suggesting the substitution of modern sporting rifle in writing and advertising relating to assault-type weapons. A suggestion that's employed intermittently and more often by gun publication writers and industry spokespersons than AR-15 enthusiasts. The National Rifle Association's own attempt to put a happier face on the AR designation resulted in its officially naming this barely disguised weapon of war, America's Rifle. A euphemism that not only fills the space alphabetically behind the A and the R, but is based on the undeniable fact that more than 16 million ARs are currently taking up residence in American homes. Hard numbers backing up its national identity claim. For once, and I'm pretty certain for the only time, I agree with the NRA. Any, if any rifle could be labeled America's, it's the AR-15. This is the last section. In the early 1950s, Experts in the Army's Operations Research Office analyzed more than three million casualties from World Wars I and II in Korea. They concluded that, and I'm, I'm quoting, more soldiers were killed by randomly dispersed fire than carefully aimed shots, suggesting that a light recoiling rifle that could, launch, that could rapidly launch multiple projectiles in a controlled yet simultaneously spread pattern could ultimately be more effective on the battlefield, unquote. This cold, bureaucratic, but clear-cut finding led to the development of the M16. And reports from the field, beginning with increasing body counts that followed the M16's deployment in Vietnam, provided evidence for the effectiveness of, quote, rapidly launched multiple projectiles in a controlled yet simultaneously spread pattern. This language also describes perfectly the assault rifle's effectiveness when deployed in stateside schools, churches, nightclubs, outdoor concerts, and shopping malls. Perhaps the inevitable legacy of the M16's domestic twin, the sword that remains a sword, the AR-15, America's rifle. my wonderful colleague for the cycle. How are we doing, everybody? We're in the seventh inning <laughs> stretch here. Um, let's see. Um, so it was the poet um, Judy Gron who made me want to be a poet, who taught me how to be a poet. And it was the poet, the writer and teacher, Chris Brandenberger, who taught me how to be a teacher. And um, they just happened to be partners and they happen to be here today. <laughs> so um, this is a bit of a tribute afternoon in the spirit of tributes. Um, I wanna start with a short poem by Judy. That's okay, Judy. Yeah, okay. Um, we just read her memoir and her book of poetry in my memoirs by poets class. So. Um, Mariah actually read this one to us. I'm gonna read it again slowly. A plain song from an older woman to a younger woman. I am not olden, 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 it is unwanted. Wanting, wanting, I am not broken, stolen, common. I am not crinkled, cranky, poison. 
I am not glinty-eyed and frozen. I am not aged, shaky, glazing. I am not hazy, guarded, craven. I am not only, stingy, little. I am not simple, brittle, spitting. Was I not over, overridden? It is a long story. Will you be proud to be my version? It is unwritten. Writing, writing. I am not ancient. Am I not ancient, raging, patient? Am I not able, charming, stable? Was I not building, forming, braving? Was I not ruling, guiding, naming? Was I not crazy, brazen, chosen? Even the stones would do my bidding. It is a long story. Am I not proud to be your version? It is unspoken, speaking, speaking. Am I not elder, berry, brandy? Are you not wine? before you find me in your own beaker. Thank you. And I'm just gonna read one more thing, sort of another tribute piece. This is a, uh, I wrote one thing I like in the last six months, and this is the thing, and I've been reading it over and over, so apologies to those of you who've heard it. And apologies to my dad, who's heard it many times, um, and who's also here today. It's a letter from my father, and I wrote it um, after we had the chance to visit Gila River, the incarceration camp where my grandparents were imprisoned during the war, during World War II. We went this summer together, took a road trip, spent many hours in the car together, and it was, it was actually, it was pretty good. We did all right in that car together. Um, and then I came back home and I wrote this letter to my dad, sort of processing that trip. So here it is. Dad. There's a new way I see the garden now, the one you've been tending for decades on Garden Avenue of all names, the street of our family home. In haiku, written by former camp prisoners, days and seasons are tracked by the falling leaves of the moss rose petal to earth. Poets in camp, numbered months and years by the memory of their home gardens left behind on the west coast. Flowery rhododendrons and peony buds imagined, imagined as remaining firm. I think of us traveling that week in the summer of 2019, away from California, along the train's course, through Arizona and on to Santa Fe. How far I brought you from your garden. Did you think of the sagos, the summer tomatoes and basil, the azaleas and red maples, the night blooming lantana, the trees needing trimming, the grass going brown, all of the work awaiting you. Did you imagine the dogs chirping and the silent white bucket and mom dragging the hose across the lawn to wake the fountain? Here in the Southwest, I find myself pining for the great Central Valley, as I did when I lived in New York or that decade by the bay, exhausted from cold bridges and colder waters, longing with my entire body for the landscapes of childhoods, kingdoms, smog, dust, and all. I understand now I am nothing. I am the daughter of a living father, blessed to be returning to you after these fire and ice travels through North American landscapes spotted by our elders' lives, their prison desert homes, and other jails and prisons with and without bars and barbed wire. You were not taken. In the night and shirtless, you were not captured or broken by the century's light despite my nightmares. You took your time in the summer garden where Lee and I played as the light set basiling our bodies against mosquitoes, baking mud sweets in California's sugary dusk. Dad, your voice is wise now, beyond kindness. I'll see you soon. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to invite up Tim Skeen, my mentor and fabulous poet, please join me in welcoming Tim Skeen. Thank you, Bryn. 
can only hope that one day my daughter would read a poem to me that is half as beautiful as that. Terrific. Lifting weights at 60. Years of skinny failures bring my body to this last run up the flagpole. I will not be denied. In the army, we call Tylenol ranger candy. Now I call it morning, noon, and night. <laughs> Whatever it takes to make the biceps and the triceps curl. The orthopedic surgeon says, ease up. Motion is lotion, but you're not 50 anymore. Still, I have earned the pleasure of hearing one young bully tell another, come on, don't fuck with him. Someone like that ought to stick to Twitter where the digital tigers roam. <laughs> Push, pull. You never know at this age if the synthesis six will make its way to my arms or my arteries. My wife says she hardly knows me anymore. That's the point, isn't it? I say not to worry. This is just another obsession like numismatics or prosody. My daughter, the cross trainer, tells me about micro tears and how they make the muscle tissue grow. And don't forget stretching. She means well. Everyone means well. <laughs> 3D hostage rescue training target. The world narrows and becomes purposefully blurry when you put on the 3D glasses. Then suddenly, you can see the rage in the perpetrator's face as he cradles the girl's chin with his left hand and raises the gun in his right hand at you. Close cropped brown hair, tribal tattoos, tight white t-shirt. Perhaps you could pick him out of a lineup of hard luck men, men whose desperation you might even imagine. But there's no time now, no time for how, or who or why, the victim reaches for you with her left hand, fingers splayed, the way Julia Adams reached into the audience when you were a kid, trying to break free from the gill man in the Black Lagoon, his love mistaken for hate by the audiences wearing their red and cyan colored glasses. In the background, a woman in a yellow Angora sweater puts her hand to her mouth as if to stifle the scream. No time for side alignment, no time for a slow squeeze of the trigger. Just stance, just breath, your grip. Then tenderly touch his chest, dead center mass, inches from the girls. No! The university at Marburg. Not as a soldier this time. Not after having been up all night on maneuvers with Feldjäger burnt a Rosen looking for a downed helicopter, which, which we never found, enduring his maniacal driving, his Nicky Lauder grin as, he tie, as the tires of the Bundeswehr VW screeched through every curve, not after being dropped off at a bridge marked as destroyed on the NATO map in the night under orders to stop all vehicles trying to cross, not when the Leopard tanks started their engines throbbing out of the dark fog, spun on their tracks, and went across my bridge, missing me back by an arm's length. Not after reporting the next day that I'd seen nothing. No one, not even the ghosts of the Second World War. Not after gazing in awe at the, awe at the university's Gothic architecture, looking over my shoulder while gassing up a Jeep at a POL point just outside the campus walls, but to walk now wearing a corduroy jacket, where students have walked since before Shakespeare, to walk slowly on this side of 40 years. That other while ago, when a car hits our neighbor's beagle, breaking its back in front of our house, my mother tells me to drag her into the driveway. Eugene leans over his dog, Tears running down his face. I can't, he says. I just can't do it. My mother tells me to get the 22. The edge in her voice makes me run. She cycles the bolt and hands the rifle to me. You know what to do, she says. 
The moment I squeeze the trigger, I join the army. The moment she points out where to dig the hole in the backyard, I get out of the army. The moment Eugene, on his knees over the grave, looks at me, open-mouthed, eyes red-rimmed and wide, I become middle-aged, then old, then alone. Fall dream of my father, who's been dead now, I can't believe it, five years. Then I took a walk, a long walk, next to riparian woods, a cobbled path, sunshine like weak tea, long grass in the prairie, and arrived at a bus that had been carved and whittled entirely out of wood. Everything from the axles to the windshield wipers, rough hewn. Somehow I knew my father had made this monument to idleness. I thought of the pile of shavings he must have left and how much of my memory of him is being left behind. This is a found poem. Love is a fabulous thing, 1958. Here's a fabulous album filled with inventive portraits of love, from a chance flirtation to moments of ecstasy. The melodies are sophisticated and dramatic, yet the kind the world expects from one of the most popular composers, Les Baxter. Some people have heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> then it ruins the poem. Les Baxter. <laughs> He's informed each theme with a provocative title, inviting your imagination to dream along with it. Les's thrilling orchestration sparkled with fire in this richly romantic tribute to the universal emotions of love. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Maida Bang. How's everyone doing? I feel like I'm gonna have to squeeze this a little bit lower. I can't see everyone. It's a new mic stand, so I've been having trouble with it. That's right. All right. What a, what a treat it has been to hear all of my colleagues. I, uh, I feel extraordinarily honored to, to be joining the faculty and to be, to be uh, now part of this amazing um, and uh, deeply rooted tradition of creative writing uh, in, in the Valley. So uh, thank you for having me. So I'm gonna be reading three poems, and these are new poems. Um, this, uh, this first poem that I'm gonna read uh, is, uh, it, it was a, came out earlier this week, actually it was this week, yeah, uh, as a poem a day for the Academy of American Poets. And uh, uh, thank you to Oliver De La Paz, who's, he's not here obviously, but he selected this poem to be included in the series. So I just wanna have a chance to share this and read this out loud, but just to kind of give a little bit of context on the poem. Over the last few years, I've been uh, working on a lot of research related to this new book of poetry and uh, as a poet, I'm not used to miring myself in sort of this world of objectivity, of facts, of information, of details, of accuracy, you know? I, um, and so, so for me, it was sort of a challenge to have to kind of use another part of my brain. And so this is a poem about having to sort of excavate a kind of new truth from my interior self. Out of research into reveries. Give up the brain. Offer down its clumsy meditations, its blurred face of fury, its hellbound policies bugged into my throat. Cough out that sickled attitude, the ragged shelves downing my, my ankles, every era of hibernation. It's all in the performance the butcher operating on slabs of my identity, the bereaved dissecting memories of an octopus. Lift out far from it. 
Careen the elbows out of mark with wine taken by the midsummer full moon, constantly stoneward, hunting toward heart still. Okay. So, uh, you know, I've said, mentioned a while ago that I've been doing a lot of research. Um, well, part of the work that I've been doing around this research led me to. Uh, examine the biology of honeybees. So again, completely outside of my disciplinary field, um, and definitely not my wheelhouse. But uh, uh, as I was doing sort of this research on honeybees, it, you know, there, there's more and more information coming out about the importance and role of the honeybee as, uh, as the one specimen that will help and to sustain our ecosystem um, and, and the value that they bring to the sustainability of that. Um, and so, I've been also looking at the ways that uh, the government had been researching on honeybees and figuring out how to weaponize honeybees, um, you know, for malicious reasons. Um, and so this poem is thinking about the role of the honeybee, what would happen if the honeybee decided to sort of revolt against humanity. Um, and uh, the poem actually opens with an epigraph um, about, uh, about the kinds of experiments that have happened with honeybees in recent years uh, through the, uh, the Department of Defense. Recently, scientists have exploited the honeybees' exceptional use of smell, trained bees to detect the scent of various explosive materials. Researchers are exploring genetic and physiological differences between engineering, between bees. Ideally, a superior bee could be developed through genetic engineering. Plans also include integrating very small fluidic devices to carry chemicals that could be delivered through the cyborg's sting. Ultimately, uh, DARPA, which is the organization underneath the Defense, Department of Defense that is conducting a lot of these experiments, DARPA hopes to hack into the insect's own natural senses, allowing the remote control operator to look out of the insect's own eyes instead of attaching a video camera for it to carry. Revolt of bees. Achieve us into your creatured machine so that we may shrine before you as immortal. This is how you love us in your, in your illness of benevolence, your mind a canister for vanity. By merging our wings with steel, you nourish us with the need to war with you. We will show you the plague you've made of us, butchery of our eyes no longer in our belonging, as you condition us with a diet of bombs. No more to return the bounty of your spring, but only to murder your harvest, rupture your remembrance of nectar, clover, goldenrod, lantana, thyme, Retribution is the devil begging to be pardoned. Is the devil always homesick? Is the devil dangling from a situation of blade? Clingstone peach, almond, plum. We will raise a scorching on your tongue so bloomed and medieval, your sense of sweetened will cease to begin. Okay. So, deadly bees fighting back against humanity. Um, and this is my last poem, uh, the work of having to sort of channel all of this, um, all of this research into a whole body of work. And so this is a poem about the channeling. Guide for the channeling. Toward a worn legacy of rain, I have been lost down every jungle path, adrift and senseless to split open a cascade of knowing. I have tried with all my limber to keen a credo of justice, shelter those who solace inside graves. I have been boiled in my bladed search, opening with questions of a deserted pain to end with a cemented breath shattered into silk. 
this is where I am taking you, into a discarded vista blowing forth a silent blaze here in sunk villages of the disregarded, here where even the dirt of the land cannot muster against the threat of air, biomedical, vegetation, munitions unfound, every footprint incarnate. Where the highlands are tangled to the ground, a place no matter how remote will always be too near and too much a reminder of an expired war. Refugees not called as people, only to be called the outcome of an event. We are venturing into swell beyond swelling of paperwork and protocol, slips of memo and routing, cable and classified meeting. Here is the talk, biological weapon, yellow spots, apiary blame for decades to wane and cold filed. Believe me as a torch of this wandering that I have been digging within the origins of redaction. Believe where I am taking you. I have been shoveling upside down, and now my eyes stagger, my hands ache, my legs becoming hunter, my back a raging shadow. I have been gardening myself into this remembrance. Thank you.